How many of you are happily married? Shout amen. amen. Good. I had a couple of stories for you this morning. Uh, I'm told these are true. I don't know. You figure them out whether they're true or not. Um, marriage is a relationship in which one person is always right and the other is usually the husband. <laughs> when our lawnmower broke and wouldn't run, my wife kept hinting to me that I should get it fixed. Somehow I always had something else to take care of first. The truck, the car, email, fishing, you know, always something more important to me. Finally, she thought of a clever way to make her point. When I arrived home from work one day, I found her seated in the tall grass, busily snipping away with a tiny pair of sewing scissors. I watched silently for a moment and then went in the house. I was gone only a few minutes when I came out again and handed her a toothbrush and said, when you're finished cutting the grass, you might as well sweep the driveway. <laughs> the doctors say I will walk again. <laughs> Why are married women heavier than single women? Because single women come home, see what's in the fridge, and go to bed. Whereas married women come home, see what's in the bed, and go to the fridge. <laughs> Guys, it may be your fault, <laughs> all right? A woman was looking in the bedroom mirror. She was not happy with what she saw and said to her husband, I feel horrible. I look old, fat, and ugly. I really need you to pay me a compliment. The husband replies, your eyesight's absolutely perfect. <laughs> and that's when the fight started. <laughs> My wife sat down on the couch next to me as I was flipping channels. She asked, what's on the TV? And I said, dust. And then the fight started. <laughs> I got more, but I'll stop there. Yeah. I want to continue our series today. And uh, I, I love speaking marriage things. I, I love speaking family um, series. I love speaking to children and, and children and the parental relationship uh, I love that. It's a passion of mine. And I think one of the reasons is, is because uh, I am one of those incredibly blessed individuals who is living with my dream woman. And that's the truth. Um, I have, in my estimation, now don't ask her, she might give a different answer, but in my estimation, I have um, a great marriage. We have a lot of fun together. We do things together. Uh, we are very seldom ever separated. It's, it's crazy, but very seldom ever are we uh, separated from one another. We go everywhere together. We do things together, um, and, and it's been that way for 32 years. So one thing we learned early in life is the value of a partnership marriage. The value of a partnership marriage, and that's what I want to speak on today. God's design for a partnership marriage, and I'm going to begin today by reading a passage of scripture that I read in the very first week of this series, we go back to the book of Ecclesiastes chapter 4. We're going to begin in verse number 9. And here's what the scriptures say. Two people are better off than one, for they can help each other succeed. If one person falls, the other can reach out and help. But someone who falls alone is in real trouble. Likewise, two people lying close together can keep each other warm, but how can one be warm alone? Solomon wrote this before electric blankets, of course. Um, a person standing alone can be attacked and defeated, but two can stand back to back and conquer. The value of partnership, the value of working together in life is unprecedented. There's, there's nothing greater than seeing what I refer to a lot of times as a well-oiled machine. A well-oiled machine. And I know marriages that are a well-oiled machine. And then I know marriages that are completely squeaky because there is no oil. <laughs> so the ideal plan and God's design is for us to be in partnership with our spouse. How many of you believe that? Say amen. Amen. Okay, we've already discussed in this series that when the two of you got married, you were no longer one flesh, you were 
uh, or you are no longer two flesh, you are now one flesh. And one flesh always works together, all right? For example, my body is one flesh. Now, when something gets out of, out of cahoots, I had a kidney stone one time. Any of you ever had a kidney stone? Shout amen. amen. We probably ought to just shout it, oh, because them things hurt, man. They're bad. Listen, and uh, so when you pass a kidney stone, what the doctors ask you to do is to strain everything for a, in a strainer for several days until that kidney stone comes out of your body. Then they want you to bring it to them to analyze it to tell you what it was. Okay, so uh, during the time that that kidney stone was hung in that little short tube, uh, when it was hung in there, my entire body was out of out of sorts. I mean, the entire body. Uh, it was one of those incredibly painful things that you feel the the pain in your pinky toe. You know, your head is pounding. Uh, in my case, the pain was so intense I began throwing up violently. And it was just really, I also had gallstones and it did the same thing one time. When something as small as a kidney stone, if you're able to pass it, it's small, amen? Some people are like Paul Seegers and has to have him broke up. He's a chronic kidney stone man, all right? Uh, he, he needs the crown. He's like the king of kidney stones over there. But when you can pass it, it's small. And what blew my mind was something so small can cause so much pain. It's just absolutely amazing, okay? You get a little bitty small blood clot in your stream, and that thing goes in, into your brain, and it'll kill you. Just a little old bitty small clot, okay? So little small things can affect the entire body. So now let's go back to the marriage relationship as no longer two but one flesh. When one of you are out of cahoots with the other some way, some form, some fashion... There is great pain that will happen. One or the other of the spouses are going to endure major pain when you're not functioning together as a partner. The book of 1 Peter chapter 3, verse number 7, tells us that husbands and wives are fellow heirs together of the grace of life. We, Susan and I, when we got married, we became fellow heirs from God of the grace of life. We are walking together. We are one flesh. When you married Brian, you guys became one flesh, fellow heirs together of the grace of life. When Wayne, when you married Janet, y'all became one flesh. And y'all been married for how many thousands of years? Uh, 54. There we are. That's right. So what we know is that God intends for us to be in a partnership marriage. God has designed us to live that way. Now, in order to fulfill God's plan, we have to do things His way. We cannot do it our way. We cannot listen to our friends who are single telling us how we should react in a marriage. Are you with me? Say amen. Are y'all smarter than that? You can't listen to someone who's in a terrible marriage give you advice about how to fix yours. Are you smarter than that? Say amen. We have to go to God's design. So in order for us to get to God's design, we have to go to the Word. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to turn some of you off right now, uh, or you're going to turn me off, and then you'll rejoin us in a few moments, okay? But here is God's Word, and I'm going to prove my point in a minute. Men are to be the leaders of your home. Men, you are to be the leader of in your home, both physically and spiritually, you are the head. Okay? <laughs> I know, I'm the neck that turns the head. I've heard it all. Men, you wear the pants in the family. Yeah, but I'm the belt that holds the pants up. I've heard it all. Yeah. And one thing I have discovered over the years, and listen to me carefully, and ladies, if this is you, I want you to shout amen loudly when I'm finished with this point. One thing I have discovered over the years is that most women want their husband to lead. And then there are those who don't. Then there are those who don't. Okay? If you are a lady who does not want your husband to lead, you have to be in control of everything while you are not functioning according to God's plan. Now, I want you to get this. 
that does not diminish your role at all. That doesn't mean you aren't equal. That doesn't mean you aren't fellow heirs of the grace of life given from God. That doesn't mean that you're worthless and you're to be trodden on and that you are man's possession. That is not what that means. That just means in any viable partnership, somebody has to take the lead. Somebody has to take the lead. Can you imagine if you went into your workplace tomorrow and nobody was in charge? You would try to rise up to be in charge. And then others would rebel against you and you would quickly figure out that leadership is not all it's cracked up to be. Somebody has got to set the course. Uh, how many of you have ever been on a cruise? Say amen. amen. Did you know there's somebody up in the pilot's house, up in the wheelhouse, whatever it is you want to call it, there's somebody there who has charted the course and is making sure it's on course while you sleep while you eat while you do whatever it is you're doing on that ship someone is leading it to where it needs to be that is the way it has to be in your marriage someone has to lead it to where it's supposed to be and it's God's design that it be you man that's God's design okay First Corinthians chapter 11, verse number 3, the Apostle Paul understood this principle, and here's what he said under inspiration of the Holy Spirit. But there is one thing I want you to know. The head of every man is Christ. The head of woman is man. The head of Christ is God. Guys, let me tell you something. When Christ is your head, your wife will have very few issues following you. But when your head is your head, that woman's going to have problems following you. Because one day you're going to do this, one day you're going to do this, one day you're going to spend all y'all's money on something stupid, and she's going to have to suffer, the kids are going to have to suffer. But listen, when you are following God, man, when your head is Christ, everything falls in order. Everything falls in order. Paul also said this to the church at Ephesus in chapter 5, verse number 22, beginning there. For wives, this means submit to your husbands as to the Lord. For a husband is the head of his wife as Christ is the head of the church. Now, how many of you ladies will amen to the fact that that is God's plan? Say amen. amen. How many of you are going to do better in that? Say amen. Oh, oh, I knew that was coming. Amen. How many of you men need to do better at making Christ your head say amen? amen. Say amen are more honest than women always. 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 They don't communicate that, but they're honest, you know. Now, I realize this is not popular teaching among the modern day feminist movement, uh, but it doesn't change the fact that it is God's design. It is God's design. It's the way God intended things to be. So this morning, I want to take just a few moments and, and talk about some of the common problems that men and women alike have in, in relationships, in marriage, okay? So uh, these, the first part is uh, common problems that men have in relationships. These are common. Almost every guy I've ever talked to, this was the problem. It's not exclusive, but the majority by any stretch of the imagination, this is it. Men derive their identity more from achievement than relationship. Men derive their identity more through their achievements than through their relationships. Right? And I say amen and amen to that. If you ask me who I am, the first thing I'm not going to tell you is I'm a great husband. But I will tell you I'm a good woodworker. Y'all with me? We're going to derive our identity through our achievements. Women are not like that. They derive their, their identity more through relationships than they do achievements. All right? It's just the way we're, we're made. Number two, men are trained for their work, not relationships. And, and as I got to meditating on that point, I thought back to my own upbringing. You know, my dad taught me to work. When, uh, when the sun came up during the summer, we were out of school. When the sun came up, so did I. 
On Saturday, when the sun came up, so did I. There was no such thing as sleeping late in my house. It did not happen. Uh, Mom and Dad were convinced if you slept past 6.30, you were lazy. Lazy. And you know what? What they did, they raised up uh, five children. And let me tell you, all five of us work. And we don't stop. We work. And we don't mind work. I love work. So I'm thinking about this right now, that when I was being raised up, my dad taught me how to do many things. He he taught me how to plant a garden because I had to work in the garden all summer long. As long as those veggies and all were were, uh, producing, I had to pull them, uh, help pull them. I had to shell peas. I had to shell butter beans. um, I had to uh, weed the garden. Now, we had a garden that was about the size of this auditorium. And I had to get all the weeds out of every row, away from every plant. I had to learn to fertilize and pull that dirt up around the base of them so it could really do it. Um, uh, God usually took care of the watering, but when we went through a dry spell, I had to go out with sprinklers and move them and help do that. Um, I had to go out and get the eggs for my chickens every single morning. Oh, we had boatloads of chickens. And I had to go get them every morning. And... That was my thing. Before school, son, go get all the eggs out of... And and I was born in 64, so we're not talking about back in the Depression age. But my mom and dad were Depression children. So they understood the value of work and the value of getting your food. Now your total idea of getting food is going to Walmart. And that all works fine until COVID strikes or until a hurricane comes and you hadn't got any food in your house. So dad taught me early how to do this. Um, For those of you who are carpenters, he had me cutting rafters uh, for uh, pitched roofs. He had me cutting rafters by the time I was 10 years old. He taught me how to use a framing square to figure out the pitch, mark it, take a skill saw and run it, and then hand it up to him on the roof. He taught me all of this work. One of my brothers who was 13 years older than I am, he is 13 years older than I am, taught me how to do a lot of things. He taught me how to work on cars. He taught me how to build cabinets. He taught me how to do all sorts of other things. But not one of them ever trained me in relationships. Not one. All my dad would say is, son, be a man. Be a man. You know, all my training was in my accomplishments, in my achievements. How many of you guys are there? Say amen. Amen. So I had to get to a point where I realized that I might need some help in the relationship department because I am a, by nature, a relational moron. I am. And I'm going to tell you, when Susan and I got married, she had to train me of how to be a good husband because I didn't know. You want me to build you a cabinet? I'll build you the most beautiful jewelry box you can imagine. Oh, you want me to be a good husband? Oh. <laughs> I don't know nothing about that. You know, so I had to start learning some things. Now, here's what I'm going to tell you, men. Young men, you find a man who is a man and takes care of his family and works hard and loves his wife, and you make him your mentor. That might be your dad. It could be your grandfather. Or it may be another man that you know, but you learn after someone who is successful in it. Man, when Susan and I first got married, I loved to sit down and talk to older men. I don't say old men anymore because I'm quickly approaching that age. I would sit down and talk to them. I'd ask them about life. Hey, how did you deal with this when you were young? Well, Mike, they were different times, but here's how I dealt with them. One thing I've noted, noticed, over time, you go through the same situations, just a different view of that situation, just a different way of dealing with it. What we're dealing with now is nothing new. Solomon said there is nothing new under the sun. Everything that's here has happened before. In the beginning of the COVID crisis, you remember, um, I gave you statistics of all the plagues that has hit the world in the past, all the way back to recorded history, what those plagues were. That's probably about the first Sunday in June, if you want to go back and listen to it, if it's still loaded. I give you all these things. We don't need to freak out about COVID. The world has been here before. And the world survived. Amen? They did. So, no need to run and hide. You learn from those who have been there. Men, you learn from others who have been there. When men come home from work, many want to go hide in their new term, the man cave. 
and be left alone to play their video games. I am blown away at the grown men that will not get up and take the garbage out because they're too busy on their video games and they let their wife take the garbage out. Look, if Susan and I have a disagreement at home, most of the time it's going to be about, woman, why did you take that garbage out? I told you I was going to get it before I went to bed. Well, I, I went ahead and took it out. No, you took my job. And the fight is on. <laughs> you know what? Guys, we need to be that man. We need to be that man, amen? We do. Other men find things to do all the time to avoid communication. Oh, I can't talk right now, I'm busy. What you doing? Uh, uh, I love to work at nothing all day. Let's go. Those of you who were raised in that area will know that song. Our culture, another problem, our culture has diminished the masculine image. The man is often portrayed as a complete buffoon on TV shows. Think back to one of my favorite shows, Home Improvement. That was one of my favorite. Tim Allen is just a funny guy. That's all you can say about it. But he was a complete buffoon. And his wife was the same normal one. Tim was always electrocuting himself, blowing up something, whatever. A complete buffoon. Or either Hollywood portrays the man as being a feminine man. Okay? Look, I'm one of those guys, when I sit down and watch TV, I like watching manly men. Give me Rambo. Give me Arnold Schwarzenegger. Susan will ask me sometimes, what do you want to watch? I don't care. As long as somebody's getting blown up, let's watch it. <laughs> because I'm smart enough to know TV is just entertainment. It's not indoctrination. It shouldn't be it anyway. All right? So men have been diminished. The masculinity of men have been diminished. And, and I'm certainly not going... Uh, I'm, I'm not saying anything negative, but I'm going to tell you, um, there are some things that men are wearing these days. Number one, I don't know how they get in it. All right? I, I just, I don't know. Uh, I am thankful that the skinny leg jean thing is gone. Now what they're doing is they're wearing suit coats that are like five times too small. I don't get that. I mean, they try to move and their arms stop right here because they're wearing something. Cool. I look cool. I'm in style. Or they button their button. And my Lord, if you're standing in front of them, that sucker comes off, you're going to get a black eye. I, that style I don't like. I don't. I know it's the new style and it is what it is, you know. I, I grew up in double-breasted suit era where the suit coat was always buttoned and you always look classy i like jared jefferson that dude shows up for church man got a bow tie on today jared good for you bud <laughs> you know so uh that's the era that i grew up in not so much now but guys listen you don't have to look feminine to fit in you need to be a man so you can be a man amen now, that's all I'm going to say about that, because I have a lot to say about it, but I won't. Now, there are common problems also which women have in relationship. And listen carefully. I'm going to roll through them fairly quick, because I don't want to get in trouble. <laughs> Relationships are a big source of competition between women. Big source of competition. Oh, wait a minute. You're hanging out with her more than you're hanging out with me. What's the matter? You don't like me? I'm not good enough for you? Look, I've had a couple of friends over time who wanted to monopolize my friendship. I cut them off as fast as I can. Because if you expect me to only hang out with you, you are in trouble. If I'm your only friend, you have no friend. <laughs> because it's not a competition, amen, ladies? It shouldn't be. Women often try to control relationships. They try to control relationships. Women often take on too many relationships at a deep level. 
or either become exclusive with just one friend. You know, one end of the spectrum or another. I'm going to have a hundred friends and I'm going to spend time with all of them. I'm not going to spend time with my husband or my children, but I'm going to spend time with all my friends. Yeah, you can't do that. Or I only have one friend and that's the only one friend I'm going to have. And if my one friend has another friend, I'm going to get mad at them and make their life hard. Oh yeah, you see them all. Women, here we go, listen to me carefully. Remember the... The sermon today is God's design for living in partnership marriage. Women will often confide in their best friend before they do their husband. Ooh, that one's going to leave a mark. Women will often confide in their best friend before they will their husband. Ladies, do not be that woman. Your husband is your partner. He needs to know exactly what's going on with you. Even if it's a female problem, you need to talk to him about it. Because he needs to know. Do not cut him out. Do not bypass him. He is your partner. Women sometimes have issues with male leadership. Okay? We live in that culture. That male leadership, I, I talked to one lady, and she's not here this morning, so I can say this about her. Um, I asked a lady one time, I said, um, uh, she's, uh, she's 70, 72, 75, whatever. I said, why aren't you married? Her exact word, I mean, she didn't even waste, there wasn't a moment's thought. I ain't having no man tell me what to do. That was it, at that fast. And I said, well, there we are. Thank God you remain single. You'd have made some poor dude miserable. So some ladies have issues with male leadership. But that's not God's design. It's not. Okay? This is certainly not an exhaustive list of, of major issues among the different uh, genders. But it's certainly one that probably resonates with most of us at some point on some level or the other. But they will all lead to struggles in your marriage, in your partnership. We must come to the point where we realize that we are truly one flesh and begin functioning as one flesh. You should support your spouse. Do you understand that term? I don't mean financially. I mean emotionally. Listen, there are times that my wife just needs to be left alone. Now, when we first got married, I didn't get that. I took it personal. Oh, you don't want to be with me? You don't want to hang out with me. I'm so much fun. And so when she didn't want to be around or talk or say anything, I took it personal. But I had to get to the point. Sometimes she just needs to be left alone, and I need to support her in that. And, and if that is her day, then I would take the kids, and we would go whatever we had to go do. Just give her some time. She'll be fine. You know, girls, let's go walk. Let's go, let's go to the woods and walk around in the woods. Let's go. Let's go have fun. Yes, I had my girls in the woods. I had them in the lake, I had them in the river, you name it, we had them everywhere. Sometimes Susan would know I just need to be left alone. She could see it on me, she knew what was coming, so it's like, come on girls, we're going to go to town, we're going we're gonna to go away for a little while, uh, your dad needs to be left alone right now. So she supported me in, in those times, but you know what? There were times, I'll never forget this. My dad died in 1993, January of 1993. I was in a music rehearsal at the church I was serving at that time. And um, somebody walked out on stage and said, Mike, uh, there's a phone call for you. You need to come and get it. So when I got to it, the, it was nothing. I had a feeling I knew what it was, so I picked up and called the hospital. And uh, the nurse told me, and I guess this is the way they train them to say it, but anyway... Um, the nurse, I said, uh, my name is Mike Callahan. I'm calling to check on my dad, uh, Pat Callahan. Well, Thomas is his first name. And um, she said, who are you again? I said, I'm his son, Mike. I'm the youngest of, of, of us. She said, sir, I'm, I regret to inform you that Mr. Callahan has expired. So I had to walk back out on stage, and I had to shut the rehearsal down. Uh, we knew there was something going on, so Susan and I were kind of halfway packed getting ready to head to Louisiana. We lived in Florida at the time. And so we, 
We took off. This was about 9 o'clock at night. We left our house uh, about 20 minutes from Disney World, and we began driving. We got on I-10. We went up 75 I-10, and, and um, I, I began crying so hard about the time we got to the Florida state line. Susan, you remember this, don't you? I was driving my truck. She was following in uh, the car because she was going to have to come back quicker than I was. And got to the state line, and, and I literally, I couldn't see anymore. I was crying so hard. I pulled over into a rest area, and she didn't know why I pulled over. We didn't have cell phones then. Uh, rich people did. We didn't. Uh, we didn't have pagers. We didn't have nothing. We had sign language in the window going, you know, whatever. And so pulled over, and, and I couldn't even open the door. She opened the door, and literally this happened. She opened the door, and I fell, and I fell on her, and, and just weeping, could not control myself. I don't remember how long we stayed in that rest area. I have no idea, but she supported me until I collected myself, got back in the truck, and we continued the drive, you know, and I'm going to tell you, guys and ladies, I have never forgot that moment. It'll soon be 30 years. But I remember that moment like it was last night because she was there to support me. She didn't try to ask me, what are you crying about? Why are you so upset? You know he's in heaven. Why? She didn't say a word. She just held me. That's what I mean when I say you should support your spouse. Sometimes they need you to just shut up. Amen? I learned something about my wife a long time ago. She don't need no fixing. She don't need to be fixed. She just needs me to support her and be her cheerleader. And that's what I am. That's what I am. You go, girl. <laughs> you cook that cake. Whew. That's the best thing you ever made. Well, that's what you said last night. And that's what I'm going to say again tomorrow night. Because <laughs> I'm your cheerleader. <laughs> and that's the way life should be. You are partners. Amen. You are partners. When you learn to live in partnership with your wife, with your spouse, let's just say whichever way, if you're a woman with your husband, with your husband, with your wife, and we don't confuse those around here, okay? When you learn to live in the partnership that God designed, your marriage will grow and it will bloom and you will have a happiness that you can't even imagine. But when a marriage stops growing, it starts dying. And that's a dangerous spot to be in. Look, I am a, I discovered in my later life, probably in the last 10 to 12 years, my mother passed on to me, we, she was living with us, my mother passed on to me a love of plants. I can't even tell you how that happened. I used to have some plants down in Florida, but I killed them all. You know, I thought, well, I watered it last year. What's the problem? I don't, you know, I don't get it. So my mother taught me the art. My mother also taught me how to kill a chicken and, and, and clean it uh, out in the backyard with my little girls watching. We're chopping heads off. And mom said, okay, we're going to do this and you're going to do it. She showed me. She showed me how to reach up in there and clean them, the insides of that old chicken out. She taught me all kinds of things later in life. You know, we're talking in the last 20 years. But she gave me a love of plants. And I have learned my new passion is propagating plants. How many of you know what that term is? That means you cut one off and you put it in dirt and you nurse it until it forms a brand new plant. Some plants you can propagate, some you cannot. All right? So um, one thing I have learned, and I'm propagating uh, several new pots at the house right now, as a matter of fact, getting ready for the spring. I want them to look beautiful. So... One thing I have learned is that if you're going to have a successful plant collection, you have to water them, you have to fertilize them, you have to protect them from the cold. Look, if you came to my house right now, it looks like uh, some kind of, uh, uh, I don't even know what the term would be, some kind of indoor plant nursery. Because this cold weather, we move so many of them in our living room. I have to walk like this to get into the bedroom right now because I got my peace lilies in, got all this other stuff in there. But I learned if we're going to have beautiful plants during the spring and summer, you got to protect them in the winter when, the, when the, it gets cold. 
And it, during the summer months, you have to take the more tender ones and you have to get them out of the direct sun. They can't handle that. They like bright light, but not bright, not direct sunlight. So you have to know how to do with what you know how to do. And you move the ones you have to move out of the sun and the ones that need the full sun, you move them in. My point simply being this, it takes constant maintenance to raise successful plants. Are you with me? Say amen. How many of you are plant killers? Say amen. I will pray for you. Your marriage is no different. You have to study that partner. You have to figure out who that partner is. You have to figure out what makes them grow, what makes them shrink. You need to figure out what makes them happy, what makes them angry. And you move around all the pieces that you have to move around to make it work to where when spring and summer get here, you got something beautiful. But if you neglect them and you leave them out in 18 degree weather, what you're going to have, at least for those tender plants, what you're going to have is a bunch of wilted dead plants. Folks, your marriage needs constant maintenance. Don't think, well, we got married and I told her I love her the next day. And if it ever changes, I'll tell her. You know, uh-uh. Look, I'm one of them dudes. Susan probably hears I love you for me 50 times a day. If I'm not saying it, I'm texting it to her. You know, thank God for emojis. I love them things. <laughs> you know, you can go into romantic emojis and find all these sweet things with little emojis blowing hearts out of their mouth. And Yeah, I'm that guy. We, we flirt with each other. We love hanging out with each other and, and, and keeping our romance and keeping our love alive. Why? Because we're partners. And that's the way God has designed you to be. I heard somebody yesterday, uh, we were talking in a different setting. And um, this particular lady said that she was in a divorce recovery group uh, back some years ago. And she said, as they're sitting in the divorce recovery group, this, this group of ladies, all they could talk about were their children. They didn't talk about their husbands. Nothing. They didn't say anything. Or maybe it was a marriage class. I can't remember which one it was, but regardless, it doesn't matter. And all they could talk about was their children. And they came to her and said, hey, what is your input here? And she said, y'all don't want to hear my input. And they said, well, sure we do. She said, probably the reason you're in here is because all you can talk about is your children, not your spouse. You need to start prioritizing your spouse instead of those kids. Those kids are going to move out and leave you empty nesters one day, and you're still stuck with the one that you've neglected. Amen? Amen. Trust me. From those of us, we raised seven kids. We are now empty nesters having the time of our lives. Thank God we're empty nesters. Because we enjoy each other. We didn't have to get to know each other all over again. When the kids moved out, we did that the entire time because we constantly maintenanced our marriage. You need to as well. Okay? You cannot neglect something and expect it to grow. Listen, Lenny goes out of town. We, we're next door neighbors. Uh, Lenny has more plants than I have. It's like this competition between us. <laughs> Springtime comes. Lenny will tell me, I'm not getting any more plants. I'll walk over to his house and he's got five new ones. I go back home, tell Susan, I need to go to Lowe's to the plant store. <laughs> Lenny goes out of town. He doesn't ask us for anything. What he says, hey, will you water my plants? <laughs> Yeah, buddy, we got it. We go out of town. Hey, will you take care of the dog and water our plants? <laughs> you know, we got that partnership worked out there. But listen, there are three things that are vital in a partnership marriage you must have. And I'm going to wrap this sermon up really quick right now. Number one, you have to have a total commitment to one another. If you're not totally committed, you're going to have a problem. If you have an exit plan, you have a problem. You have to be totally committed. Number two, it takes consistent, constant effort. It takes constant effort. And number three, it takes clear communication. That's the three things that you have to have 
in order to have a partnership marriage. There are many here who have a great, long-lasting marriage. You saw that last week. Uh, some married, uh, with at least three different ones in the church married 50 years or more, or getting ready to turn to 50 years. Several of us here have been married over 30 years. Some married 20, some married over 10. We saw that last week. Listen, uh, for those of you who have a long-lasting marriage, you are part of a shrinking number of Americans. You are part of a shrinking number of marriages. Matter of fact, and I was blown away this week, statistics say that somewhere around 63% of marriages will end in divorce. Far more Americans are in a second or third marriage than those who are in their first marriage. I couldn't believe it when I read it. I knew it used to be about 50-50. Now it's over 6 in 10 will end in divorce. If you ever struggle in your marriage, for those of you who are newly married, considering getting married, whatever the situation may be, if you ever struggle, you need to seek advice from someone who's been there for a while. Someone who's been there for a while. Someone who has figured out the key to making marriage work. You need to seek their advice. You need to make that man or that lady your mentor and learn from them. That's the way to a successful marriage, is learning that. And you know what? I think it's good every now and then for, to talk to people who are in long-lasting relationships that maybe they're in their second, third, or even fourth marriages. They've figured out how to make things work. Look, we don't live in a perfect world. We do not. If you've went through a divorce, you, here's what I'm going to say, and listen to me carefully. I don't mean any disrespect, but you need to move past that. Don't get stuck in that moment. Don't get stuck in that anger and bring that anger into your next marriage because I'm going to tell you, it will destroy that one. You need to release it, let it go, and enjoy the woman that the Lord sent you after you were divorced from the other person. And not while the other person was still married to the other person. You get what, y'all get my point? All right, there we go. We're smarter, we're adults, we can figure that out. You need to rejoice with that person. Turn loose of the past. We don't live in a perfect world. I wish we did. I wish we did, but we do not. So, listen, divorce is not the unpardonable sin. Don't think that it is. And don't ever think that God is throwing you out on the trash heap. Churches do that, but God won't. God won't. Some churches will throw you out on the trash heap if you go through a divorce. Don't buy into that. That is not God. Amen? Amen. So learn the art of partnership with your spouse. But above all, above everything else, Allow God to transform your marriage. I wrote this last part out because I didn't want to miss any of it. God can and will improve your marriage relationship. God must be given the right to lead your marriage. God has the power to give you the support you desperately need. God will give you the emotional stability that you must have to maintain a healthy marriage. God wants to grow your marriage and will make it beyond your wildest dreams if you allow Him to. God can help you become the spouse you were always meant to be. God literally wants to change your life. Allow Him access to the deepest recesses of your heart. Allow God to all the way move in. Listen, you're struggling in your marriage. My guess is there is at least a part of your heart, part of your life, I'm not talking about the blood pumper, part of your life that is closed off to God. You have this secret chamber over here somewhere where you've got your secret life jammed in that and you don't know why your marriage is in trouble because of that secret chamber. That secret chamber. You have to open that thing up and allow God to do a junk clean-out day. Now, I'm going to tell you, that's painful, man. When you allow yourself open and God starts reaching in and convicting you of the wrong in your life, that is painful. You will become angry. You will become depressed. You will become whatever. I've had people walk out of the church before angry at me. I mean, angry at me because they thought I knew something on them and I was preaching right at them. I had one person say, why didn't you just come to talk to me direct instead of doing in front of the whole congregation? I, what are you talking about? I have no idea what you're talking about. 
Oh, but God did. Amen? Listen, it's not easy when there comes junk cleaning day. It's not. But I'm going to guarantee you this. On the other side of that opening up every recess of your life to God, you'll be a much happier person. That marriage you're in may not survive. I don't know the damage that's already been done. It may not. But you can be right with God. And that's the ultimate goal, is to be right 